So I'm Jay Familietti. Uh, I'm executive director of the Global Institute for Water Security here at University of Saskatchewan. Welcome to this special lecture by USASC alum and distinguished professor emeritus uh, from University of Waterloo and adjunct professor at University of Guelph, uh, Professor John Cherry. First, um, let's remember that as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationships to one another. So there are um, very few people who can live up to the once in a generation or once in a century status, but John is one of those people. His career is replete with paper firsts, um, and he literally wrote the book on groundwater, this, this book right here, that has been read, I don't know, by tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of graduate students. Um, I actually used it twice um, uh, in both my master's and my PhD groundwater classes. John went on to do all kinds of pioneering work on groundwater contamination and contaminant hydrogeology in his career, putting not only himself on the map, but also Canada as global leaders of the field. It's no surprise then that one of John's most recent awards was the 2020 Stockholm Water Prize, which if you don't know, is pretty much the Nobel Prize of water. I think that that says it all, but there are a couple more things that I wanna say about John. First, that I think it's pretty rare for a giant in the field to look back over his career and then to say, hey, you know what? In the 1980s, we, we missed this. In the 1990s, we, you know, we should have anticipated that. We should have really thought about nanoparticles and microplastics and PFAS. And that's exactly what, what John did. And I saw that pre-COVID at the Waterloo Novcare Conference. I think that takes great humility and I think it should be a lesson for, for all of us. The second, as I am thinking we're gonna find out during this talk, is that John doesn't really sugarcoat how he feels about the groundwater situation in Canada and around the world. I think he's outspoken uh, about this tenuous situation that we find ourselves in. And I think that takes great courage and great leadership, and that's what we get from Professor Cherry. We'll hear John's talk, which is called Groundwater is the Key to a Sustainable Earth. And then we'll go straight to a sit down with John and myself uh, for a little back and forth conversation on Canadian and global groundwater. So John, welcome. Thanks, Jay. It's my great pleasure to be here. It all started off uh, in when I was, I guess, 1958. And there was an eight o'clock class in introductory geology and I was wondering whether I should get out of bed and, and uh, go to it because it was really cold, but I did. And when I got there, Dr. Earl Christensen, now deceased, who was at the Saskatchewan Research Council, gave a talk uh, to this introductory uh, group of geological engineers and, and geoscientists. And Earl, if you remember him, was a most amazing, um, enthusiastic person. And so he gave his talk and he said, groundwater is gonna be really important and then he said he had a summer job at the Saskatchewan Research Council. So after the class, I went over and applied for this job, and and I found out I got it. Uh, and I didn't. I was very proud of myself because it was a big, big class of engineers, etc. And later on, he told me I was the only applicant. <laughs> because in that era, when you went into geological engineering, you were going into it, you know, to make money in mining and oil and things like that. And groundwater wasn't on the map at all. But Earl's parents were immigrants from Denmark, and they chose rather poor land, apparently, and so they suffered greatly in a depression. So that was the that was what got Earl uh, going. And my parents grew up in Saskatchewan, and they used to tell me about the the depression era, etc. So that's that set me off. And when when we were graduating from that class in '62, um, we had our final ceremonies, and the dean said, "Well, we've." done our best to educate you the best we can, um, and, and we educated you for export, because there wasn't a single job in engineering for, the, for that class in Saskatchewan in 1962. It was a farming province, a farming province with actually an amazing university. 
uh, considering uh, the financial state, etc. So that set me off uh, on this journey. And uh, so, um, yes, as Jay mentioned, I received the Stockholm Water Prize in 2000. And that was the, the first COVID year, so they didn't do anything real. And then last year, they did some things uh, virtual. And then this year, uh, last month, they had their, their great occasion, et cetera, with, when there were three of these Stockholm Water Prize winners. But in, nine, in 2016, I received another uh, big prize. It's a big prize in, in Asia called the Lee Kuan Yew Water Prize. Uh, the financial reward for that one is about double the Stockholm Water Prize. And in Asia, they're very, uh, very proud of it. And so when I arrived in Singapore then, um, I immediately realized that they'd, they'd arranged for all sorts of media events. And that they publicized their, their Water Week in Singapore and other things through their media events. And it became very clear that nobody wanted to hear about TCE uh, or, or 14 dioxane or nitrate or anything like that. So in fact, I quickly realized that what I built my career on, which was contaminant hydrogeology, was really irrelevant when asked the question, uh, is groundwater important? And if so, why? Um, so I had to scramble then to try and figure out why is groundwater important and in a world where I couldn't talk about my own research, etc. And that set me off on this journey. Um, and I failed miserably, I think, in all my little sound bites on CNN Asia and whatnot trying to explain groundwater, and I've been kind of working on it ever since. And I thought I'd lost my opportunity to uh, do such things, and then the Stockholm Water Prize came along, so I started to work on it again to try and figure out an answer to, uh, answer to, this, uh, to this question. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today, an attempt to answer at uh, this question. Now, an alternative t a title for this talk uh, could be this one, Leading Us Astray, Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions Will Not Result in a Sustainable Planet. Or this is a more accurate title, Groundwater and the Impending Collapse of Civilization. <laughs> um, I've been advised not to use this title when, I t when talks are advertised or I wouldn't have an audience. But in fact, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So my formative years were in the late 50s into the 60s. Uh, I became a, a student here in 58, and then I became a professor at Manitoba in 67. And those were very formative years in the world. Lots of things were happening. And there was this book, uh, The Population Bomb, uh, by a Stanford professor. So back in that era, the great fear of those people who were interested in thinking about the future of humanity was population. And population was just starting on its exponential growth curve. Um, and uh, this professor got a lot of attention, and then he fell into disrepute as, population, as worrying about population you know, basically fell into the past. Uh, China imposed its one-child policy in 1979 one child in the cities, two children in the country. And in fact, it's just this year that China's population has leveled off. And if China hadn't imposed that population, they'd have a, pop they'd have a population about two and a half billion. And they've had famines and all sorts of things in the past. So that's why they did that. And then there's this famous book, Limits to Growth by the Club of Rome. And this book was produced by a bunch of computer people at MIT. And they did a whole bunch of computer modeling and whatnot. And they decided then that the, the, way we, the way society was going in 1972, that we were going to run out of resources. Uh, interesting that they didn't include water then as a resource that was worthy of, of modeling in their, in their system. And then this was a famous book in its era, uh, Small is Beautiful, the Economics as if People Mattered. Um, nothing less than a full-scale assault on conventional economic wisdom. Newsweek, number one of the most 100 influential books published since the Second World War. It certainly wasn't influential. Okay, it got a lot of press, and a lot of us read it and went on and so forth. But the economics community immediately ditched it. Uh, now, this is the population graph. And the one on the bottom now is very probable. Uh, when you look at population statistics, this is going to be most likely. And we're going to level off, apparently, at about 9.5 billion people, maybe 10. Okay, and, and back in the era, in the 60s and 70s then, it was considered to be a catastrophe if we reached 5 billion people. So in the 1950s to 70s, there was a great concern about future of humanity. This concern disappeared by the 1980s. Basically, it disappeared because of conventional growth econo economists took charge, where growth is what matters and everything else will be taken care of by the market, apparently. So for human existence, we need enough drinking water, 
but we only need enough safe water, you know, 50 liters per, uh, per person, you know, 1,000 liters for a family, et cetera, and then you can have sanitation and, and safe water and all of that. And we need 2,000 calories for people, and then it, it, the climate must not get above 4 degrees C. And if we have these things, then we're going to be at least surviving. So groundwater, key facts. So 99% of all liquid fresh water is groundwater. Now, I didn't know that number when I started off this journey to try and answer the question. Uh, and and, and, and it's, so the groundwater reservoir is huge compared to the surface water reservoir. Furthermore, most of the water that's in rivers and streams and wetlands and whatnot is groundwater at some time. It's just gone in there by, uh, by, by seepage, et cetera. So we kind of forget about that. Most surface water has groundwater origins, and groundwater is depleted in many areas, et cetera. So when drought comes, groundwater becomes the only fresh water. And as you notice, the media drought has come. It's even come back to Western Canada, et cetera. So wow, people completely forget about drought. When drought comes, the only water available generally is groundwater. So groundwater is everywhere. It's everywhere beneath our feet, fresh groundwater, at least some of it. And uh, just to remind you then, groundwater travels relatively slowly, you know, in sand and gravel between 0.1 and 1 meter a day, and in fractured rock, you know, 1 to 10 or 100 meters a day, etc. So groundwater is slow moving compared to rivers and lakes, uh, etc. But in terms of contaminant migration, other things, uh, things can happen over decades. So there are various maps of large aquifers of the world, and then it depends on how you, you define them. Um, uh, and, and so 40% apparently of all the groundwater are extracted from these, you know, 37 large aquifers in the world. And then one third of them are apparently depleted beyond recovery in human time. Like, isn't that astounding? And we're just getting warmed up in terms of depleting aquifers, I think. So humanity is wrongly distributed across the planet. You know, water deficiency and dry climates. Drylands cover 41% of the Earth's land. 30% of the world's population live in deserts and drylands, and 40% of all cultivated land is in drylands, you know, and, and they're surviving except when drought comes. So we're on a disastrous freshwater trajectory for humanity. Uh, Four billion people live in areas of severe physical water scarcity for at least one month per year, okay, and, and in places like Mexico, this has moved up to two or three months a year. So what's happening now, we're just moving up on this scale. When, when half of humanity will be living in areas with water scarcity. Now, more than 2.1 billion people have no access to safe drinking water. And I'll get back. This is a very important number. I'll get back to it. Okay, these people are living in water poverty. And we have these projected numbers. Projected groundwater use increased by 30% by 2050. Well, of course, that's nonsense. There's no, there's no water to base these increases, et cetera. So when we look at the current situation and we look at the population increase and we look at the affluency increase and whatnot, we produce these water projections and it's all kind of nonsense. So groundwater irrigation dominates. Uh, in the black here is groundwater and we've got India. I mean, India is amazing. You know, they, they extract something like 90% of all the groundwater in the world and China's about 50% and 71%, et cetera. So if you add up the population of these countries, then you're getting, you're getting towards half of humanity, which with their groundwater is irrigation dominant. All right, so the real title of this uh, talk is uh, Groundwater and the Impending Collapse of Society. So we've got to get on with that. So disasters happening now in India. India has 1.4 billion people, like one-fifth of the global population, but only 4% of the global water. India's population surpassed China's this year. India's population is going to go up another 300 million people. Um, and India is the largest groundwater extraction, extractor, 90% for agriculture. And tens of millions of farmers have huge water insecurity. And you may have seen you know, news clips about this, the number of suicides in India amongst the farming community, where they have, you know, 260 million agricultural workers, etc. And this has all come about from, from basically too much drilling and too much subsidized electricity, too much technology coming into a world where, in fact, there was no planning. And so the poor farmers get going and their whole livelihood when they borrow money for pesticides and fertilizer and whatnot, and so they commit suicide. So disasters on the way in India. Disasters happening now in Iran. 
quote, this is from a peer-reviewed paper, groundwater declined due to extensive over-exploitation of groundwater and rising salinity levels points to dire worsening water security risks across the country. Iran is facing a state of water bankruptcy. So when you see the news media about all the political instability in Iran and you read about because it's government incompetence or whatever and whatnot, you almost never see the fact that water is mentioned and, and basically groundwater is at the key to it. But like take, take the U.S., the High Plains or Gala Aquifer in the U.S., which is part of the American bread basket. One, so one third of the major world's aquifers are irreversibly depleted and this aquifer is one of them. And the areas in red are where the water levels are continually going down. And they continually go down because they're based on irrigation and the farmers need to irrigate to keep making money. So basically the water levels will continue to drop until you can't lower your pump any, any longer and then the farmer will have to leave the land. So as I mentioned, groundwater is the only source of fresh water during drought and the planet is extremely drought sensitive, which we human beings completely forget about. Like, who remembers the Great Depression and all the, all the blowing of the soil and whatnot around in Saskatchewan, unless you've got grandparents or parents of, of my generation? Um, all right. So much of the western half of the United States is in a grip of a severe drought of historic proportions. Okay, here's a reservoir in California. And I visit California very frequently for projects, and they had a three-year drought a few years ago. And when their three-year drought was going on, you'd think that the sky was falling down. Like, it was only a three-year drought. Okay, the big droughts are coming. Drought in North America. This is a more recent map, and it's even coming up here into, into the Plains region of, of Canada. So, uh, as we all know here, uh, Canada, basically the western provinces, grow 50% of the world's wheat and 20% of barley. And then when you take the crisis in the Ukraine, and you take the political turmoil that involves Russia, apparently we're up to about 30 or 35% of the grain in the world that's caught up in, in, in political turmoil uh, or drought. Okay, and we're, not, we're not seeing the crises yet. You know, there's enough grain in reserves, et cetera, et cetera. So, we have these highly publicized droughts, and I was in Cape Town. It just so happens for a hydrogeology conference in 2017, right at the time when they were just on the verge of turning off the, tra the, 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 uh, the taps. A big, big deal. So what was that all about? That wasn't about a drought problem. That was about a water management problem. In fact, with the political disagreements between the federal government and the provincial government in South Africa, they hadn't, they hadn't gone ahead and dr done the drilling needed to find out how much groundwater storage they had. So the drill rigs had arrived during the drought. Okay, now they know that they've got enough water, so if this happened again, at least it could last for a period of time. Uh, Sao Paulo, the same thing. Uh, basically, mismanagement of, 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 of water, not knowing your groundwater reserves, or pumping groundwater too much so it's not available when you need it to, during the next drought, etc. in California. So long droughts are coming, um, indicated by the climate of the past thousand years. Oh, in France, okay, this is basically from, uh, from just a, a month ago. The drought is the most severe recorded in our country. Well, that's not right. They mean it's recorded in their history, but it's not recorded in their paleohydrology. So if you look at history, you only go back a couple of hundred years. Well, what's that mean in terms of, of climate cycles and and so forth? And this is a publication which uh, I was involved with, with my colleague uh, Beth Parker and, and a postdoc, et cetera. And, and, and we, we looked at recharge on a sandstone mountain outside of LA where we could look at recharge using chloride because the unsaturated zone was so thick. And if you take the recharge indicator and you take the tree ring indicators and you take the, the ice core indications and you put them all together, then you've got the blue areas and the, and the yellow areas on this graph. And the only point here is that these yellow areas are, are times of, of deep drought, maybe even much deeper than we're seeing at the present time, a deeper and longer. So what are we human beings, what have we been doing? We've been living in a kind of, we've been living with our heads in the sand. And now we start to fuss about greenhouse-driven climate change. Wow, like what about all this climate change that's gonna be coming at us anyway? Okay, so let's go to the Middle East where they, some of those countries have money to buy food. Fossil water wells are supplying hundreds of millions of people globally. 
few regions value water as much as the Arab region, etc. Where 85 percent of the population live under conditions of water scarcity. Scarcity, and these green dots on this, these ma on, on the map, that's irrigation areas. So what are the Saudis irrigating with? They're irrigating from deep aquifers, and that's all paleo water. It's not rechargeable. So that's water mining, of course, and that'll come to an end. Now, the concept of a global food crisis came in, in, in 1945, right after the Second World War, because there have been many famines and whatnot and so forth. And this resulted in the so-called Green Revolution. And I really didn't quite know what the Green Revolution was before I started on this journey to try and answer that question. And it's a complete misnomer. And we'll get to that as we go along here. So what is the Green Revolution? According to Wikipedia, it, uh, it involves a number of initiatives. It involves high-yielding crop varieties. Okay, that was a great idea, and that saved, saved hundreds of millions of people. And the person who developed that won the Nobel Prize. It included high-yielding varieties of cereals, especially dwarf wheat and rice. But it was extended to include mechanization, you know, huge tractors, chemical fertilizers, and pesticides. But it was propped up by irrigation. Okay, so lost in the fine print is the fact that the reason why we are able to grow our agriculture globally so much is basically groundwater irrigation. Um, and uh, that covered up many of the defects of, of soil becoming less productive, et cetera, et cetera. And much of this irrigation is using unsustainable groundwater. So irrigation demand for agriculture sector already amounts to more than 70% of global water supply withdrawals. So if we're talking about water, we're talking about agriculture. Like really everything else, everything else is irrelevant. And groundwater and food. So 40% of global agriculture is by irrigation. Okay, you say, well, what about the other 60%? Okay, the other 60% is dry land farming. Okay, very dependent on climate. 70% uh, of irrigation water is groundwater. Okay, the standard number you see is 40%. My colleague Warren Wood, who is a retired professor at uh, at Western uh, at uh, Michigan State University, he likes crunching numbers and whatnot and so forth. So then he noticed that that the number should be 70% of irrigation water is groundwater because you have to take the water, the base flow water in rivers and streams. If you're irrigating with that, well, that's groundwater. So when a drought comes along, that's going to disappear. And this 70% number then includes the standard number, which is 40%, and then 30% from river base flow, et cetera. So during long drought, nearly all food then that's irrigated has to come from groundwater. So the world food supply chain is dependent upon groundwater, which is a diminishing resource. So now the, the uh, 15 years ago, the, the recipient of the Stockholm Water Prize was Tony Allen, a geography professor at uh, at uh, the University of London, uh, and he invented the, the concept of virtual water, you know, a very simple concept, but very clever when you look at it. And he noticed that it takes like 50,000 liters of water to produce a kilo of beef and 1,000 to produce a kilo of wheat, etc. And then he noticed then that we, if we want to look at water and food, we have to look at the, f the water that's embedded in food, and it's being shipped all over the world. So how come the Saudis can have a population of whatever it is? You know, what's the Saudi population? 60 million people living where there's hardly any water. They can do it because, because food's being shipped in. In essence, water's being shipped in. So virtual water enables people to live where enough food cannot be grown. So it allows us to live where we wouldn't otherwise live. It allows us Canadians to eat all these foods from all over the world whenever we want them um, because other people are shipping us their water. And I was living for a year and a half uh, during COVID in a small fishing village in uh, Nova Scotia and going into a local grocery store, I found in the wrong time of the year, asparagus. So I looked at the label, asparagus from Peru. Isn't that amazing? Asparagus from Peru in a little fishing village at the end of the earth in Canada? How can that be? Um, and then I found an article on it. This article focuses on Peru, peer-reviewed article, where agriculture export production has led to huge economic growth and employment, but at the expense of unsustainable aquifer depletion. Okay, so this is short-term economic growth. It provides jobs and a whole bunch of things, and it's going to come to an end. So who gets hurt in all of this? Who gets hurt? Well, it's always the poor that get hurt, not the people who made the money out of shipping the crops. Furthermore, then, irrigation has been going in such a poorly managed uh, way with people, you know, making money out of it, that it's causing massive salinization in some areas. So not only are we using water that's unsustainable, but we're busy damaging soils in the process. 
Now, this, this is an important diagram, which is not all that well poised. So sea level is rising 3 to 10 millimeters a year. Okay, we all know that. We're all supposed to be afraid of sea level rise if we live near the coast. But 25% of that sea level rise is coming from this excess groundwater we're pumping. Isn't that amazing? We're pumping so much groundwater that, in fact, it's causing the sea to arise, arise 25% of it. Maybe the number's 20%. Maybe the number's 30%. Who knows? Because we keep so little track of how much water is pumped when we grow food. Now, the other important number here, then, is subsidence. So in many places around the world, in the coastal cities, because you so happen coastal cities are built on young geology, and the young geology depends, tends to have high porosity clays, etc. So subsidence rates are typically in the range of 6 to 100 millimeters a year. So these people who are threatened by relative sea level rise, it's not climate change at all. It's basically groundwater pumping. It's depressurization and it's a rising of sea level. So where do you ever leave, read that in the news? But not only that, the rates at which these communities, large cities like um, the Indone uh, Jakarta, the, Indone the Indonesian capital, that they're going to have to move the whole capital city and whatnot and so forth, it's all related to groundwater. All right. So the Green Revolution agriculture solved the peak food problem. So this business of people back in the 50s and 60s worrying about the population bomb and all the collapse that was going to happen to us then, it all kind of subsided because of the Green Revolution and we were able to produce food in amazing ways in addition to cutting forests so that we have a less and less forest land. Chemical fertilizer degrades the soil and pollutes, and pesticides degrade the soil and pollute, and unsustainable water and unsustainable soil. Okay, that's what the Green Revolution was basically all about. So the Green Revolution it was a dirty revolution for groundwater in particular because nitrate is basically all over the place. And you can say, well, but most people aren't, mo most wells that have nitrate in them don't exceed the drinking water limit. Okay, that's because the drinking water limit is 10, micro 10 milligrams per liter N. Uh, and that limit was set 70 years ago. Okay, the experts on this tell me that if you were to reset the limit today, you'd set it at one. And if you set it at one, then all sorts of water then wouldn't be allowable. You'd have to treat it. Why isn't it set at one? Because no government is, is capable of doing that. Okay, all hell would break loose. The public would wonder what the health effects of nitrate are, and, uh, and we'd have to change agriculture overnight, which we can't do. Um, and, and so there's so much excess nitrogen put on the ground that the groundwater reservoir has been loaded with N. And all that N is seeping out into reservoirs, rivers, and lakes, and one and so forth. Rivers and lakes, it doesn't matter too much, but estuaries all over the world are turning green, partly because of the end coming from, from groundwater seepage. And this is some numbers produced by my colleague, Warren Wood, and we won't uh, dwell on it, but he's crunched the numbers. So if we take the groundwater mass flux, 81% it goes to river drainage system and 14 to closed basins and 5% direct, directly from aquifers to oceans, and this 5% going into estuaries where, that are very sensitive to end and can be a big deal. So the Green Revolution uh, plus large expansion of irrigation using disappearing groundwater equals unsustainable food. So the Green Revolution as a solution to the global food problem was a mirage. And my argument here is that the mirage then will be, is, is going to be coming clear. So in fact, it's probably coming clear now every day. So we live in a globalized economy where increased food choice, but also increased food security because of economic expenses for unsustainable agriculture. And of course, this is the age-old argument about, about the environment. If, if, you, if, you, if you don't internalize the costs, then you're not really, you're not really paying for the, the damage. So agriculture uses more than 70% of the land surface of the entire planet. And as I go looking for numbers, sometimes the number is 60%, and I've recently I've seen a number as high as 80%. So we're not even keeping track well enough of how much of the bloody planet we use for agriculture. Or if we are, we're not, we're not willing to, uh, to see the numbers because they would mean there to have to be major change. So too much global agriculture has squandered global freshwater resources and ultimately, ultimately we be, will be detrimental to poor countries. Okay, so how do we humans do all this crazy stuff? We do it largely with subsidies. Okay, and there are two big subsidizers in the world. There's the EU and there's the United States. We Canada, Canada has very little subsidies, so I'm told. So in the common agricultural policy of the EU, direct payments to farmer, farmers account for more than 40% of the entire annual budget of the EU. Isn't that astounding? And that's all subsidizing agriculture that's breeding basically civilization to its end. Um, and it's very similar in the United States. 
So if we human beings actually wanted to do something to save ourselves, the first thing we would do would be to change the subsidies. Either take them away or, or basically direct them at, at sustainable agriculture and, and uh, repairing the land service and all of that stuff. So these slides were taken from a recent Netflix movie that I'll mention in a minute. But global water withdrawals, like it's still going up. Like that graph isn't level yet. And then if we look at meat consumption, in the US it's going down, you know, and Canada and whatnot, but it's going up globally. Because China and India and other countries like that, they want to eat meat. Um, yeah, and so, so where, does much of the, where does much of the agricultural product go? It goes to feed uh, 1.5 billion cows, 1 billion pigs, and 1 billion sheep. So we're busy feeding humans, and we're busy feeding animals, so we humans can eat, can eat the animals. So the people who are arguing for a much lower meat diet then, they're doing it on the basis of, of uh, saving the globe. So two major changes needed. Uh, we need to change agriculture by changing the food we choose to eat, and we need to reduce the amount of fresh water that escapes to the oceans. Okay. Uh, and um, so we all know now that China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Okay. So it's, it's, it's great fun. We can pin the blame on China now. Now they've got 1.4 uh, billion people, so their per capita uh, releases are, are still relatively small. But what we didn't realize, and I didn't realize it until a few days ago, that China is now the largest consumer of, of meat. Now they've got 1.4 billion people, so it kind of makes sense. So what the Chinese leaders have figured out that China is no longer food secure. So in fact, the Chinese leader has declared that his people had to stop eating, eating so much meat and McDonald's now in China, you can get tofu burgers, etc. Um, and this is going to have to come all over, not giving up meat, but we're just going to have to eat much less of it. So modern agriculture, we have to reduce the modern form of agribusiness. Uh, we need to uh, basically increase ecological agriculture and there are all sorts of different forms of ecological agriculture, including factory growing. And in the Netherlands, apparently, there are huge multi-storied multi buildings in which you can grow food. Food was causing virtually no damage. And here's an invention that goes under the radar screen uh, that I've been hearing about. These are boxes. These are basically soil physics boxes uh, designed uh, back at the University of Florida long ago. And in the water, at the bottom of the box, you have your water, and then you have a screen, and then you have your soil and all that stuff. And then you have a plastic cover on it, and you can grow an amazing amount of vegetables in these boxes with almost no water and almost no inputs. And in fact, the person who's now promoting this in Canada was a former professor employee at, at, uh, at WHO and found that he couldn't sell the concept. So there are all sorts of neat ideas out there that could make great, great progress if they were to be adopted. So we've got a world population of 8 billion, uh, and out of those, maybe we have one or two affluent people. Okay, we're the affluent. And then we've got 2 billion that are kind of marginal. They're on the edge. And then we've got 2 billion poor people living in cities, etc. And then we have got 2 more billion more people in water poverty. Okay, what does water poverty mean? It means every day the family has to either go and carry water involving mostly women and children, so that's a major part of their day, uh, or it means that the water they're drinking is unsafe because of bacteria, but because of pathogens. Okay, that's water poverty. Um, now, one third of humanity lives in water poverty. The numbers range from 2.1 up to 4 billion. So if you accept some numbers, basically the majority of human beings live in water poverty. So let's look at, uh, so this is the largest and most shameful failure of our civilization at the present time, this thing that we're calling a civilization. Um, all right, so we had water poverty in the United States and Canada more than 100 years ago. Like all the farmers out there and whatnot and so forth, how did they get their water? Okay, they had to go and drill for it themselves. Okay, so this is called self-supply. And farmers were digging wells back in that era, as they now do in developing countries, etc. And they were using very rudimentary ma machines without engines. And it's amazing how much water you can get by digging and using machines that don't have engines. So how common was this? Well, a colleague of mine who did a master's thesis on this in the US, he estimated that 45 million hand pumps were made between the 1600s and, and 1970. So that's an indication of how many wells there were. Small, simple, shallow wells done by simple means. 
And the people who study Africa and places like that, their conclusion after all these decades of foreign aid, all of it a failure mostly then, is that it, it has to be self-supply using simple drilling methods, et cetera, et cetera. So water poverty was eradicated from America by self-supply through entrepreneurship that started locally with low-cost drilling methods. Each farmer used to drill their own well, and then some farmers got together and started companies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at mountains. So as near as I can tell, 1.1 billion people live in mountain regions, mostly in, in Asia, et cetera, 90% in developing transition countries, and many live in water poverty. Well, that's a billion people living up there in the hills we don't even pay any attention to. And here's my conceptual model for, for uh, mountain hydrology. How high do people live in mountains? They live as high as you have springs and seeps. Because if there are no springs and seeps, then they can't be there all year long. So the water table in your mountains is as high as the people live. Um, yeah. And so these are slides taken out of the literature. Mine don't look that good, but these are the people living in mountains doing terraced agriculture, been there for decades. Some of them have been there for centuries, etc. And they're living there because they can actually grow food and exist, and they're living there because of groundwater in seeps and springs. I took a trip up into the mountains in China uh, about 15 years ago to see what, was, what this was like, led by an American who was working with NGO up in the hills. And, and these were some of the water sources, and many of them looked a lot better than this. They were improved. But what he found by doing water sampling and bacterial tests is that most of the people were, were drinking unsafe water. And the Chinese government brought them a little bit of electricity, brought them schools, brought them uh, uh, Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera, but, but uh, not water because that's a much harder problem. So self-supply is this, uh, this is the terminology for people who've looked at this problem over decades. And so if we're gonna solve the problem of two or three billion people not having safe water, it's got to be through self-supply. And people are going to have to be then helped to help themselves, as opposed to just bringing in big drill rigs and drilling all these wells that, in fact, generally don't work after the drill rig leaves. So groundwater is the only solution for these two to three billion people that need clean water. It's the only solution because there is no other water. If there's rivers nearby, they're also polluted. That 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 would that's uh, that's uh, even worse. And so groundwater is everywhere beneath our feet. And in 2008, I took a, a very interesting 2005 trip out into the Gobi Desert to see the nuclear site that the Chinese have chosen for their deep repository because they have more nuclear reactors than any country in the world. And we drove and drove across the desert, and then I noticed something on the side of the road, and we got out and looked at it. And it's a well. It might have been there for hundreds of years. Who would use it? The nomads would use it. What were the nomads doing? Well, they were riding camels across the desert uh, with their sheep and whatnot, because at least there's enough. When there's enough rain, you can actually you can you can shepherd your sheep. Apparently, now the nomads don't. You ride camels. They use little tractors and they they stay in their yurts, etc. So this is the water table at two meters. Very nice fresh water. Very surprising. Very disappointing to the people building the nuclear repository. That's not exactly what they wanted to see. All right. And I think I've mentioned this. So the United Nations passed a resolution in 2010 that access to safe drinking water is a human right. Um, and at that time, there were 2 billion people without that human right. And since that time, the number of people has gone up. And uh, so manual drill drilling is not new, uh, and it's being used in Bolivia and a variety of other places. There's a method developed by a German engineer in Bolivia where they can drill basically 150 meters uh, using a manual drilling method drilling small wells connected with basically hand pumps. So what do you see when you look at the literature? You see solar panels and all these things to bring technology so that people can have wells driven by solar. Okay, so some villages may need a well driven by solar, but what they mostly need is a well that you can hand pump. And people who've studied Africa say that there's lots of groundwater in Africa to supply what people need for drinking water, etc. The problem is accessing it. And there need to be better ways of accessing it. The drilling rigs used in the mineral exploration industry are one better way of accessing it, which I've been experimenting with in colleagues. And here's a drill rig uh, made in, in Vancouver that was near this village being used to look for gold. And the owner, one of my colleagues, actually the class of 62, um, you took the drill up in the mountain to drill a well for the local village. And then the water goes down in plastic pipes and supplies all sorts of villages around, etc. Is a lack of water to blame for the conflict in Syria? 
Well, the people who study this tell me it's, that's the case. And, and a few weeks ago in, in uh, Switzerland, I was talking to a grad student who's doing a thesis on this. Now, there's lots of reasons for the war in Syria. But the question is, what triggered the war? And the people who look at it basically say that agriculture triggered the war, the running out of water. Irriga the lack of irrigation water triggered the war. And here's a quote from Kamala Harris. And of course, she wouldn't know anything about water, but she would have been given this quote by the American military. And um, so commonly, experts who say it's the state of the planet uh, and know nothing about groundwater do not include groundwater as an issue. Okay, so how many have you have read this paper, 2009, by Johan Rockström? How many have you seen the Netflix movie? Okay, this is the most highly cited paper on the topic of humanity and whatnot and so forth in the environment ever published. And the movie it basically follows the paper. It, makes, it doesn't see fresh water as a problem and makes no mention of groundwater. Okay, because that's because Rockstrom is an environmental science of another sort. He doesn't have any groundwater colleagues, so he views the world through an entirely different lens. Um, so according to Rockstrom, the only three boundaries that are transgressed, the only things we have to worry about, according to him and his big, big team, are climate, biodiversity, and the nitrogen cycle. Here's another Netflix movie that I watched a few evenings ago sent, uh, sent to me, uh, and it's a very interesting one. It's much better than, than the Rockstrom movie, but the, even this one misses the main points on groundwater. But worst of all, okay, this is the big report coming out of UNESCO, rep representing all the United Nations offices, etc. Okay, this is a 2022 report on the state of groundwater. It's got some nice maps and all sorts of one and so forth, but it doesn't cover any issue that really is central to what we're talking about here. Okay, they make a quote like this. Okay, okay, we can all agree with that. But this report did not admit to the dire strait of groundwater and proposed no solutions for any of the key problems. So my point here is that we got fresh water that's critical. We've got productive soil we've got to have. We've got forests that are disappearing. We've got a climate that's going worse. And we've got oceans where our seafood is collapsing. All right, so there are people who write books on, on the collapse of civilization. And Gerald Diamond wrote this book in 2005, and before that he wrote two or three other books. So he's an intellectual uh, living in Los Angeles of, of the highest order. Okay, and his view is that societies collapse for a whole variety of reasons, but in many cases it's because of environmental degradation. And his view is that basically societies are the collapse, they choose to collapse. And here's another award-winning uh, author, Joel K. Bourne, that I talk to every week or two, uh, trying to encourage him to write another book on this topic. To feed the world with its ballooning population without destroying the planet's land and water is likely the greatest challenge that humanity has faced. To see the potential of a sustainable agriculture, this is the book to read. And he's a trained soil scientist now who does award-winning work for National Geographic. So uh, to uh, fix the groundwater pillar, we need awareness uh, and understanding. Uh, an important impediment to progress in groundwater, because I'm arguing groundwater is the key to a lot of this. OK, so if we accept that, then we've got misunderstanding here. The knowledge from research and experience is not being converted into understandable, actionable information. OK, why is that? It's because of these. These are the devils. Okay. <laughs> these organizations are what is impeding progress. And we're all slave away to write our goddamn papers and send them to these journals where they own the intellectual rights, et cetera. Okay, and these journals then, then require narrow and narrow research. Okay, so they're not encouraging the publishing of books. We don't need more analysis, we need more synthesis. So this is, uh, this is what I'm uh, involved in now with many colleagues around the world. I'm kind of a minor player in it. It's kind of going of its own, uh, its own energy. Knowledge should be free, and the best knowledge is free knowledge. We publish books online prepared by experts from across the globe in many languages with free access. So getting uh, back here to Diamond, he identified the factors that precipitate social collapse, environmental damage like deforestation, pollution, soil depletion, erosion, and climate. Uh, and we're in the midst of all of this now. So this is my concluding remark. Society has decided that the future of humanity rests on reducing greenhouse gases, and we're setting forth to do this by allocation of huge government financial subsidies to the task, but little or none to fixing groundwater, soil, and forests. This can only lead to disaster for human existence, and we're not even monitoring the path to disaster. So this is a colossal failure in public policy. 
and it'll be the last big failure that we human beings make because there'll be no returning. Now, I could be labeled a, a climate denier in no way, okay? It's just that we have to deal with all these problems concurrently, but when it comes to human suffering, it's gonna be food and water that are gonna do the most damage the quickest. And that's my uh, end of this uh, very encouraging message. <laughs> It should, it should be taken as encouraging because, in fact, we human beings have much more chance to do something about it than we do have greenhouse gases. This is not the first time that um, John has had this uh, impact on me. And so I've seen you give two, uh, two talks, the, the Navcare talk and this talk. And the theme of <laughs> the other one was uh, almost equally dire. Um, and that was about groundwater contamination everywhere and how it's inescapable. And I didn't even cover that in this lecture. So this is a huge, that? but think about that. And so, you know, you said something earlier about how, you know, people are afraid to look at certain things. And it, one of the things I've been afraid to look at, because I, I can anticipate and I think you could do, is if you put together the maps of groundwater contamination with groundwater depletion and population and all that, what do you think that would look like? So, I mean, you know, my colleagues said, John, I mean, spending your career on groundwater contamination, and now you give a, a lecture where you don't mention it, uh, and it's because there wasn't enough time. Now, gr the, the thing about groundwater contamination is that of the, of, the, of the millions and millions of contaminants that we produce and go on the ground, only a few thousand of them get into groundwater. So there are only a few thousand, and particularly there are only a few hundred that are mobile. But the ones that are mobile and persistent, they're cumulative because it takes so long to flush out aquifers. Okay, the air we can flush out, if we you shut down your factories and whatnot, the air quality gets, uh, gets better very quickly. If you stop putting your sewage into the rivers and whatnot and so forth, it disappears very quickly. But groundwater contamination is accumulative. So now we're adding to the nitrate, we've got the pesticides, and then we've got the 1,4-dioxane, and now we've got the PFAS, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, groundwater in many areas is, is a, is a is an agglomeration of contaminants accumulating over time. And people don't get that. So all this money that's been spent in the U.S. and elsewhere are cleaning up aquifers after they're contaminated, it's almost all wasted. There's this, you, almost no aquifers that you can clean up to the point where you can drink the water. If that trillion dollars had gone into groundwater protection, we'd actually have accomplished something. So it's just astounding the policy changes, the policy errors that we humans can make. So how did and, and, and the, 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 these these laws that generated all this money being spent on on cleanup, they came from they came from CERCLA, which is a Superfund legislation, and RECWA, two very powerful pieces of legislation in the United States. They were they were passed because of certain senators and, and whatnot wanted to pass them, and I, and and I forget who signed on for them, but they were they were passed with very good intentions. People were fed up with companies polluting the ground. But the end result then is, is a waste of money. Uh, they don't apply to agriculture. They don't apply to all sorts of other things. They just apply to contaminated sites. So of the, of the great failures that we've now, people like me have built careers on that, and it's been great fun. Uh, research, research dollars just flowed. So people like me have you know, spent much of our career studying things that aren't, aren't uh, basically causing human suffering. TCE does not cause human suffering. <laughs> Now, am I feeling badly about this? No, I'm not feeling badly about it. You know, I, you, we need to do research. Students need to be educated, okay? And, and if we educate students on how to think and do critical thinking, then we're, we're making progress. So money to do research is whatever it is, and we have to take it and, and use it. It's just that I wish I'd kind of realized a little bit earlier that what I was doing was largely irrelevant. Um, and then I could have been speaking to what I'm doing, which is fun and good science, and society wants it. But then there are the relevant, the relevant topics that we're now talking about here. Well, I mean, there's there's no way that what you were doing was uh, irrelevant, no, no. Because, <laughs> of course. But I, you know, I want to share with the the students and postdocs here. When I was in grad school, and you know, reading through Freeze and Cherry. What I was doing back then, which was looking at surface water interactions mm -hmm. with climate and mm -hmm. starting to think about global change, I was on the fringe, man. Everyone was doing groundwater, you know, contamination stuff. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting, you know, how 
how things, how you know, w um, the things that we study, I think, mm -hmm. in in our field, mm -hmm. shift over time and mm -hmm. and shift in terms of uh, shift in terms of importance. Mm -hmm. I want to um, uh, point out that I think you and I share uh, maybe a little bit of a chip on our shoulders about the climate and carbon stuff and how that gets a tremendous amount of attention. And it, it should. I think it's great that it, it does. But you know, I I like to say that water is next. It's time. It's time for it's time for water. And I've got a mm -hmm. sense you feel the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The now for a professor to get a research grant, if you don't tie it to, to if you don't tie it to climate change, but but climate change is being misused. It's anthropogenic greenhouse gas driven climate change. Okay. All these droughts and everything are happening now. It's got nothing to do with greenhouse gases. Like the experts on that. Uh, you know, are, are adamant about that. That climate change is coming. Okay, and if we keep on emitting greenhouse gases, we could reach a tipping point, and that's a serious matter. But all this other stuff, the flooding and the droughts and the fires and on and so forth, has to do with humanity uh, basically uh, the doing the wrong forestry, people living in the wrong places, uh, all sorts of things, oh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and natural climate change. So climate change has basically um, um, contorted the whole argument of the environment to the point where money is not going where it should go and of course that's one of my main points and so Jay you've been on the you know you didn't get into that whole contaminant um, it was too hard fiasco um, you you operate on the fringes and so this gets me to universities so so who's the blame for all of this universities have to, should shoulder a lot of the blame universities are siloed okay we're all in our little disciplines Professors are encouraged to publish more and more papers. If you're going to publish more and more papers, they have to be narrower and narrower. Okay, nobody's encouraging professors to publish books. I got encouragement. I mean, I, 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 my promotion was delayed for a year because I spent three years working on the Freeze Cherry book. I wasn't writing papers. Okay, in today's age, I would have been fired. Writing books is synthesis. Publishing peer-reviewed papers, that's analysis. We need analysis, but we need synthesis. And in the academic world, there's no credit for synthesis. Yeah, I think that's really unfortunate because I think that um, the synthesis, um, you know, you pointed to uh, raising awareness, the public communication, that's so important. Let me ask you a question. So do you think, it, so I'm thinking specifically about Phoenix right now and, and Southern California where water rights are being whatever sold, properties being sold, in full knowledge that you know another country, people from other countries are coming there, or, or companies uh, from other countries are you know thinking about the Saudis um, coming to you know the U.S. in this case, buying up property, water rights, growing whatever alfalfa, and sending it back to hmm. to their home countries. Do you think that today's whatever you know the governor of arizona or of uh, of california do you think they really understand what they're doing that they're mortgaging like the the existence of these of these cities like phoenix for example so it it's so difficult for those of us that that are kind of educated in the topic to keep track of things so that our politicians um there's no hope for them and they're 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 supposed they're they're supposed to be they're supposed to be advised by the civil service, but in many cases the civil service have been cut back. In many cases the civil service has been muzzled, uh, and and so in fact there, there's not there's not there's not the environment for the civil service to be doing the research and communicating with the academics to inform the politicians. Uh, and and um, so in that regard, I think Canada is in dire straits. Like in fact, if you if you had a personal rule that you're not going to vote for a politician unless the politician shows some evidence of being numerate and understanding science, then you wouldn't be able to vote. So, but that's something that I've said. You know, when people talk about uh, what are what are solutions to what can what can they do on an individual basis, you know, I mean, it, sure, take shorter showers, and if you live in the western part of the North America, for example, get rid of the grass. But I actually will say, like, you know, it's time for us to start asking our politicians what they think about what they think about water. And do you think that would people would have anything good to say? Well, in in Guelph, um, there's a, in Guelph region, there's a, an environmental group. It's called the Wellington Water Watchers, 
and it's the most influential uh, and amazingly powerful environmental group locally. Um, and they chose water because it resonated. And then they needed, a, they needed a, a bad person. They needed a bad guy, so they chose Nestle. Uh, and Nestle had a big water plant uh, in Guelph, and so Wellington Water Watchers, to raise money and to rally around, then basically chose Nestle. The argument was that Nestle is basically selling the people's water and making a profit. Now, the beer companies do it, and you know, and all sorts of other companies do it, but they chose Nestle because that was ring a bell. And then Nestle is a great big multinational. So Nestle basically gave up. They, they sold all their water companies in North America. Guelph wasn't the only one. And they went back to Europe. I mean, they can make billions of dollars doing other things. They don't have to be harassed by Canadian and American environmental companies. So what has changed? Nothing's changed. Basically, the Nestle plant was bought, bought by a Canadian company, and nothing changed. Way too many people are spending money on bottled water, and there's too much plastic. And, but, but people are losing trust in the public water supply. So when the public, when the public utility, water utility in Guelph has a big public meeting, which I've attended a number of ones on, and the people say, is our water safe to drink, coming out of the well, and then the, you know, the head of that authority says, it's perfectly safe to drink. Well, I'm not sure. Like, what have you analyzed for? Have you analyzed for all the compounds? And Guelph is particularly important in Guelph because Guelph is 95% dependent on groundwater out of a bedrock aquifer. So if there ever was an aquifer that's, uh, that's shall we say, uh, vulnerable, it's the Guelph aquifer. So this water coming out of the tap in, in Guelph meets all the standards, and I would drink it. But, uh, but uh, the, the question of what's in it and what are the reactions and what are its effects on the human body, those aren't answerable. Like, everything's polluted. So we, we, we citizens, then, unless you're highly informed, like, what do you do? What do you tell people? I get that question all the time, and I, I sort of answer it in the same way that, um, you know, most cities are pretty transparent. Most water districts around uh, uh, around North America, or certainly in in the U.S. and uh, Canada, are pretty transparent about what they're testing for. But you know, we know there's all the stuff that they're not testing for. So what? And I so I tell people, hey, I drink the tap water. I you know I use an activated charcoal filter. I've got right. I've got a, a pitcher in my in my fridge. I mean, what do you tell people? Yeah, I, 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 t I tell them more or less the same thing, but I'm uh, becoming a little bit more concerned. So, so um, yeah, and so the so the toxicologists, as I understand it, when they set a drinking water limit for nitrogen, you know, nitrate at ten or whatever, and they set another one for TCE, and so you got drinking water limits set for all these compounds. Well, what about the effects of of, of all of them together? What are the effects of nitrate-rich water with a pesticide? And there's a now retired professor at Dalhousie University, an epidemiologist who had a graduate student look at that out in, out in rural uh, Nova Scotia. And they, they studied you know, cancer clusters and whatnot and so forth. And the conclusion of that thesis was that there was statistical, uh, statistical indication at a significant level that the interaction, that the combined effect of a particular pesticide and nitrate uh, were causing cancer. And at one big conference I was at, this question was asked of a toxicologist, and the toxicologist up on the platform got irate. He said, we toxicologists know what we're doing, and it's quite acceptable to do each one on its own. But when you catch other toxicologists these days, they're concerned. So to decide what is safe, yeah, is, is, a, is a very difficult thing. And so what, what do those of us who at least are in the know to some degree tell people? That's a hard one now. Becoming yeah. Hard. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about these places or around the world. So you mentioned, you know, a third or so of the the big aquifers are are running out of water, and a lot of these are are, are food producing regions. So what do you think about? And you you talked a lot about, of course, the links between uh, food uh, food security and water security, and especially groundwater security. So what do you think? You know, of like Southern California and the southern uh, Southern High Plains. These places are. You know, water tables getting deeper and deeper, and and uh, there, you know, it's just a matter of time before you won't be able to pump any more water. What do you think uh, is going to happen to food? Well, I think the United States has so much diversity that if they organize themselves, they don't have much to worry about. But we Canadians have something to worry about. Like almost everything we buy in our stores comes from California, etc. And we've given almost almost up almost all of our local agriculture. So I think the one message that comes out of this 
is that we should expect our politicians to put great emphasis on local agriculture. And if we're going to subsidize something, we should be some subsidizing sustainable local agriculture. Now, the, the economists, you know, the economists that, I think when anthropologists 300 years from now or 500 years from now write, write how did our society collapse? We collapsed because we listened to, to, to uh, economists. But, so the economists say, well, they'll just be taken care of by the market. Oh, I've heard that. I've heard, especially when it comes to food and water. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. So, so now, the, 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 the globalized agriculture has brought a lot of employment, you know, to many countries. But that Peru example, apparently the people who study this say that m there are many, many examples like Peru. The, 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 the food production for export, and this is happening in countries where people are starving and whatnot. So, I mean, if, if we are going to have a United Nations and whatnot that does any good, we have to look at these things. We have to, so China, for example, they've had so many famines, like they've had famines for a thousand years and they keep track of it. And if there's one thing that the Chinese government wants, it's to be not be, it wants, it's to be totally food secure. And they've done amazing things with their agriculture. I go to China more or less once a year, et cetera. And they're now food secure, except they're eating too much beef and they've got to do too much meat, et cetera. So they put every effort to be, in, to be food secure. Because, in fact, they've had so many famines through the past thousand years, that's the one thing that the Chinese people expect of their government, above all, food security. Doesn't that make sense? But doesn't that food security, in their case, rely on them sort of outsourcing, right, doing the virtual water thing, buying property in, you know, in Africa and well, Australia? That may be, and I think that's part of their future plan, but, but right now they've, they've fine-tuned their agriculture so much that I, th I think that's their security for the future. Um, so, you know, we're willing, you know, most countries in the United States and Canada are willing to sell our land. The Chinese are buying up land in Africa. Like, all this is going on, and it's not being kept track of, and we got all these United Nations organizations, like, we, we should be expecting more. So who pays for the WHO and the FAO? Who pays for that? We taxpayers do. Like, that's all money put in a pot, by we taxpayers for these global organizations that are supposed to be keeping track of all this. Thanks. I'd like to know how you would propose to fix the publishing system. How do we get more synthesis? Yep. So 50 years ago or whenever, uh, the journals were all owned by these societies. For example, the, you know, in, in Canada, we have the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences and we have the Canadian Geotechnical Journal, and they're run by NSERC and they're paid by taxpayers' dollars. So I think the first step uh, is that uh, the scientific community, through its governments, has to take, take back the publishing industry. So the big companies like Elsevier and Springer and whatnot and so forth, their argument is, yeah, their argument was, well, it wasn't going very well, so we stepped in and we can do it extreme, and they're very, very efficient. The journals look wonderful. So, so the question is, how, how, would we, how would we stimulate synthesis? Universities, first of all, would have to have an administration that would give high credit to synthesis. So I got high credit for my book. Okay, now it, it made me and Waterloo famous one and so forth, but I got high credit for synthesis. Now there's no credit for synthesis. And as I travel across the US and Canada giving talks, quite often I'll say to a Canadian, say to a professor, why don't you write a book on that? The answer is almost uniform, because I get no credit. Not only no credit, you can get demoted or not, not promoted, etc. So so the, the 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 universities as a whole collectively, I think, would have to get together and make some decisions to change the system. Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, I think it's the, it's the intelligentsia at universities that has to accept a large part of the blame. And, and so where do we start? Like everybody's building a career. If you're a young professor, you can't go saying these things. If you're an old professor, then, then you're not sure. paying attention to. That's right. Know. And I think we still see, uh, John, that young faculty are afraid to speak up. And you know, they're afraid that the tenure discussions won't go their way. And so this is a big problem. And it's, it, you know, it's not just the synthesis stuff, but it's also sort of the public writing so and public not speaking. Not only that, but the peer-reviewed journals then have basically run this amazing system of citations. They're making so much money. They put money into the software to keep track of every damn little thing you publish and whatnot. So it basically means that every academic now has a bunch of numbers. Like I may, when I make my career, I'd publish a decent paper maybe every year or two, and they would look at the value of the paper. So now it's all these indices. 
Now, some of the better universities in the world are claiming that they're not going to look at the indices. But that's hard to do. I mean, you're looking at two people and you're trying to compare them and you get all these numbers, these H number and the I number and the, all this stuff. So, so basically, it, the, 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 the publishing industry and the whole process of what happens to research results paid for by the taxpayer has fallen into basically uh, its corruption. It's intellectual corruption. The nope. presidents of the universities would have to get together and basically decide they're going to change it. More questions? Thank you. Um, thanks. I think oh, I think one one message I get from today's talk is that it sounds like all the sustainability initiatives that we are taking, the policy, are almost sitting on the wrong track. They're busy to fix problem rather than focusing on what we've been doing and perceive and protect the one we have. Is that something that we? All, almost all of the policies I know of are on the wrong track. And then there may not be a switch button we have, but um, and I also appreciate the incentive that in the grassroots talks and the initiative we have takes time. But if I guess rather than leave it as an open-ended question, if there are things we can do, um, what would be the thing that we can start with? Well, individually, the first thing we can do is change our diet. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that and, and this, uh, I'm not new at this, eh? these numbers are there, they're all over the place. And it doesn't mean we have to become vegan, which I am, it just means we have to maybe mm -hmm. cut it in half. And, and then the other thing is that, you know, it probably kind of goes back to the publication and citation, um, goes to research funding, right? You mentioned that, you know, in the past, it's things related to contaminations with huge super fund, there will be funding, and there will be things, there will be resource for young researchers to start their career. But if, uh, and those are the keywords, the hot buttons you wanted to have to get those fundings. Uh, it, it felt like getting into a cycle that I'm just reminding me of a Chinese saying is that you've been a monk for a day, you ring the bell for one day, which means that people are diligent. They're working hard, but they lose the big picture view and they lose the long-term vision to see whether that's the right direction we are heading. And then going back to the research field is that if if all the foundings now, you know, are tagging to sustainability, where the preserve, the protections, didn't really get to the, the much of a highlight of that, and that will reduce the chance for people to get funding, it will be it kind of going to a, a unhealthy cycle again. So the word res the word sustainability has been so misused that it it's hard to even use it now. Um, and, and of course, we all think we're doing research that relates to sustainability. So sustainability and climate then are the two words that ring all the buttons. And um, so we used to have we used to have a, a, an environmental roundtable in Canada, and I think that was canceled. So almost all of the bodies we have that whereby research would be fed into uh, into the political arena. Uh, uh, now we're canceled. You know, government comes in and it gets canceled, and the next government doesn't doesn't uh, resurrect them. So it, it's uh, as an individual then, other than change our diet, I think we we have to choose grassroots environmental things that that are meaningful. So the Wellington Water Watchers, you know, with all this energy, in fact, they're they're part of the problem. They're choosing. They're they're off on red herrings. So they're busy criticizing the Ontario government for not having better regulations for bottled water. The last thing we need in Ontario are better regula regulations for bottled water, because we've got 50 other regulations we need above that. So it's interesting how the environmental groups can get off track. Maybe they're paid to get off track, I don't know. Like maybe, maybe companies invest in these, these environmental groups because in fact they're so harmless. Mm, not depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Professor. Um, thank you, and thank you for your talk. And about that, I, I want to ask you, what keeps you motivated? 
like you just mentioned, it's so depressing, so many things. So what keeps you on the track to keep uh, your research? What keeps me motivated? I must be a genetic optimist. <laughs> Um, and, and I think what keeps me motivated is, in, in fact, there in fact are many things that could be done. If I believed that greenhouse gas emissions were what was going to determine the future of humanity, then I would give up. Because in fact, international regulations on greenhouse gas emissions are not going to happen. First of all, our Prime Minister can say whatever he wants internationally, but it's going to be decided by Alberta. In the U.S. it's not going to happen. This is all smoke, smoke and mirrors. So we have to have something to hope for. And fortunately, it's all the other things. So, I mean, you know, the, the numbers vary, but, but if we fix agriculture, we're a long way to fixing the emissions. Okay, that's what people miss. Like, like whatever the numbers are, you know, I think I had them on the screen there, the, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that have come from agriculture are as large as transportation. So in fact, the, 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 the future of humanity is in our hands and we can actually do something. If it was just greenhouse gases, it would be hopeless. Hold on just a second. Uh, let's do one, one last question. Um, yeah, we actually do have one online, if we have time. Yeah, let's, we got take time? One, let's take one online question, then we should wrap it up. Okay, uh, so the question that we had was, um, there's actually a number of questions, but um, it, referencing um, geographically things happening in Africa, so maybe um, what in your experience, John, is the main problems, or uh, what are the main problems facing groundwater research and education in Africa? Well, I don't know much about Africa, but I certainly have been doing a lot of talking with people that spend much of their time there. I mean, there's all of the political chaos and all of that, but, but the, the main impediment to progress in water poverty in Africa is because the international organizations that go into Africa to provide aid have done it by donation. Big drilling machines, big this, big that. Uh, and because the local people aren't involved, then, in fact, shortly after these drill rigs leave, the pumps aren't working and whatnot and so forth. So it's taken 50 years to learn that. So it's a whole community now of, of people working in NGOs that understand that. And, and now, now then, the question is, will the money be made available to fix water poverty in Africa? And it only takes a few tens of you know, billions of dollars. When you look at how much money is going into aid, like it's $200 million billion dollars a year. Like money isn't the issue. So why can't Canadians get clean water to our First Nations people out in the boonies? And we spend money on it. We're smart people. We try. We feel badly about it. We can't even solve that problem. Why is that? It's because bureaucracies, bureaucracies are unable to solve uh, complex problems if we allow bureaucracies to have all of the, the power to do it. So in, in one of the reasons why I'm hopeful is if we, could, if we could somehow get control away from the bureaucracies, like it, our taxpayers are paying for it, Indian Affairs Canada, after 50 years, can't get, get safe water onto, onto, uh, onto First Nations reserves and whatnot. So, so there, there's, there's, there's a management system to fix. Um, <clears throat> so I, you might have noticed that I went to retrieve this glass of water, and I, I wanted to drink it halfway down so then I could ask you the question, John. Uh, what, what do you see? Well, I, I see a glass uh, half, uh, half full. Uh, that's, my, uh, that's my outlook. And then the problem with all of us, we have to figure out, we, we're all busy people, and we want to try and have an impact. And we have to figure out in the time we've got available in our day to try and pursue good. Okay, what is it going to be? That's our challenge. And we need to think it through and make sure that's going to be effective. That's a, that's, a great, that's a great note to end on. Please join me in thanking Professor John Cherry for his great lecture.